Now and for good, welcome to this course in economics of insurance, as you can see from the slide. Economics of insurance is Economie de l'assurance en français. And uh, the slides will be sometimes in French and sometimes in English. Well, basically, um, the course objectives are first to learn the, the jargon of insurance, both in French and English. And by jargon, I mean not just you know the words and you don't know what they mean, but you know the words, you know what they mean, and you have some idea of, some intuition of, not the math behind, but at least the phenomena be behind. Uh, you will see, if you have some statistics, well, if you have some knowledge of statistics or probability, things will be extremely simple. Uh, because basically it's very simple probabilistic modeling with assumption of independence and you see what happens when you relax the assumption of independence. So that's all about, pro about the mass of insurance. Uh, but then you have to know the sector because the sector is not just statistics, it's also about legal provision and, and you know, um, it, it, well, it's about the, le the legal organization of, of economic activity and, and not the, the legal provisions do have a consequence on both the players, I mean the insurance companies, and uh, the products which are sold by the insurance companies. As you will see also, the, the sector is fragmented among business lines or, or uh, um, well, you will see that there are strong differences between life and non-life, etc. And you must have some idea of uh, those differences. Uh, because it's necessary to understand the economic mechanism and, and business model behind the, the, the companies and how to make money with insurance. Uh, I won't be long on, on about this because it's not the, aim, the main aim of the course, but you must understand that you won't earn money in the same way when you su sell life insurance on the one hand and when you, you sell retail uh, uh, car insurance, for instance. And, and the profitability relies on... Is it a question? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, well, so, but in the beginning, did you, did you see the, 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 the slides themselves? No, it's still, it's still not working. The problem is I cannot change. I, I, I don't see my, my mouse cursor here. Yes, I do. Um, so what shall I do? Maybe with this. It looks better. It looks better, but now, oh my god. Now I'm stuck. And, and I, I, you, I can't change the slides anymore. <laughs> well, uh, maybe I shall buy an insurance to my computer. And, uh, oh, okay. Well, there's something which I do not understand, which is that when I go back to this, to this screen, I'm on slide seven, and last time I was on slide 16, which is to say something happens in the background, but I don't, oh my God. Um, does, does anybody has an idea of how we manage this? Because, oh, you, you can't even see the slides, okay. So that's really bad. And so what I can do, of course, is, is press this button. But if I do press this button, the result is that you see the slides and I don't see them. Maybe you think, I don't care because I wrote the slides. But the point is that I, I'm not recording the slides as well. So, <laughs> but well, maybe you, can th you think, oh, well, I'm, I'm in the lecture hall, so I don't care about the movie. But the point is that the movie is supposed to supplement the course for those who are not here, not attending the lecture, so I'm just wondering how I can, oh my god, I have all the, the shortcuts. Yeah. Yeah, th that's an option, but it will be a bit, a, a bit smaller. But you're right. Uh, maybe at the moment it's the better choice, the best choice, to get the slides this way. Um, and to remove me from the slides. Or I'm getting smaller so that you have more slides. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, for now it's the, the only thing I, we found. 
Um, so, understanding economic mechanism, understanding the business models, and understanding why this bloody computer is no stock. You see? The mail, oh my god. And understanding un un interactions with banking as well. What is this? <laughs> what the hell is this? <laughs> well, okay, I understand. Now it's, it's because of me. It's because I, I, I pressed the wrong button, but whatever. Uh, so uh, the, the, maybe one of the course objectives should be for me to master my computer. But normally it works more smoothly. You can look at the, the movies from last year and, and they were not perfect, but at least I had no such problem. So what I'm going to talk about now in, in the course, um, yeah, that's, that's a bit, a, bit, a bit better. Maybe I can as well take some things off. Okay, that's it. So uh, today I'll, I'll show you an intro, then we'll talk about product and techniques, then about insurance theory, which is basically microeconomics. Then, maybe not in the end, maybe I, I'll slice them about current issues. Well, um, in fact, the, the sources for the course are um, when I will present the sector, that will be the first chapter of product and technique, I, I draw upon my, the paper I'm supposed to release in the Revue d'Economie Financière, which is about the recent history of insurance industry. Then, most of the, well, the core of the course will be based on Alexis Dürer's uh, Economie de l'Assurance, which is still not, uh, it's still in print, but it, it will be released quickly, I think. Um, and, and by, well, I will give you uh, an extensive summary, so that's fine. And the current issues are based on my, my uh, you know, I, I directed a special issue, issue of Les Annales des Mines back in February about uh, insurance today. So it's full of, um, topics were related to well, current hot topics in, in insurance. Uh, so that's it. So you have the references. And by the way, um, the slides will be on the course website. All the course material will be on the course website, except maybe um, what will be on my YouTube channel. And channel takes two M, by the way. Um, but, wow, well, this is funny. This is, you know, this is the, the, the French proofwriter. And for the French proofwriter, of course, channel only takes one end because it's about the, the perfume house, you know, not about the, what stays be, behind the, the, the body of, of water be, between France and, and Britain. Uh, so all the course material is on the website, except the movies which are on, the, on YouTube. Um, and and, and well, my, my main problem is that all, the, all that course material is in French in the beginning, and I have to translate it. So I hope I will be quick enough. Uh, but this year, it's, it's a bit heavy because we're having some, some problems, as you have seen. Um, by the way, having uh, this material in both English and French is fine because it will give you the vocabulary in, 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 in both languages, which is one of the, the goals of the course. So uh, today, let's define uh, insurance talk about its antiquity, whether insurance is moral or not, uh, talk about the mutuality principle, which is the basis of insurance, and uh, inverted production cycle, which is com completely necessary to understand how the industry works, then uh, about the insurability of risk, and, and maybe that will be enough for today, we'll see. So if we define insurance, the funny thing is that um, French-speaking, I should say, uh, continental Europeans, on the one hand, and English-speaking people do not have exactly the same definition of insurance. So I'm taking the definition of insurance from Wikipedia in English, but the first, the first phrase in Wikipedia in English is that insurance is, the pro is a provision of financial services, which do not appear in any definition of insurance in, in, in French. Okay? But then, the insurance transaction involves the insurance assuming a guarantee, an, a guaranteed and known relatively small loss in form of payment to the insurer, which is what we call the premium, not the premium, but the premium, okay, in exchange for the insurance promise to compensate the insured in the event of a covered loss. So, of course, there is a contract which describes all the loss which will be covered, or the kind of losses which will be covered, and all the events that might trigger that might trigger uh, payment of claims 
related to losses. Okay. Uh, and by the way, here you see that the main problem will be whether you have to list all the losses that the insurance contract pays for or all the exclusion that the insurance contract won't pay for. But this is about low, so it's not my, my point. But you see that there might be refinements there. Now, in France's legal doctrine, le contrat d'assurance, par essence aléatoire, comporte, moyennant l'octroi d'une prime, la couverture d'un risque et l'exécution d'une prestation en cas de réalisation du risque. So, the, what does appear here, which do, do not exist in the English definition, is first the allusion to the randomness, le caractère aléatoire, of the contract. The English people, the English speaking people do not, uh, in fact, they, they don't care about randomness uh, because for them, the insurance contract is a financial contract, and hence it's enough to say what triggers the payment of, uh, you know, uh, claims. In the French legal tradition, for a reason which will be made clear a bit later, the problem is that, uh, you know, random contracts, I mean contracts with an element of randomness, are not, are not all uh, legal or licit or uh, uh, acceptable. Think, for instance, that today you're still not supposed to play to wager money when you're playing cards. It's, it's still supposedly forbidden. You can only pay play poker online for money. Okay, you're not supposed to, to wager. Uh, hence, random contracts are, by sense, as said by the Cour de Cassation, uh, doubtful. Okay, and then. What we see is that um, there is there is y a une couverture d'un risque, which is to say something will be paid, et l'exécution d'une prestation, and the provision of service. So the, here on the continent we have problem with contracts, financial contracts in general, and especially financial contracts involving the payment of of a, of a sum, and and we'll see in fact where it does come from. So. The definition of insurance is basically the definition of a financial contract in, in common law, while it's the definition of a very special kind of random contrat aléatoire in most European countries. Now, if we look back in the past, insurance existed since, well, the, the current form of the insurance contract. By current form, I mean you pay a premium and you get a contract. And in case there is something goes wrong, then you get the money. This was invented around 30, 1330 in Geneva, in Italy, okay, in northern Italy. And Geneva is a port, and this was the, the, the insurance contract was entering boats, I mean ships, um, especially trading ships. So this is the beginning of property and casualty insurance, ce que nous on appelle l'assurance dommage. Okay? But in fact, Albeit the contracts were different, there were already um, marine insurance contracts, for instance, in, in Athens in the 5th century before Christ. That is to say, marine insurance is far more, far older than the 14th century. The difference is that in that time, insurance contracts were not insurance contracts in the same way as we write them. That is to say, you did not pay a premium in order to get a contract. They were called uh, in English bottom loan. Alors en français, on peut dire soit de la bommerie, mais ça c'est quand même un archaïsme qui, que seuls, je pense, les assureurs euh, comprendront. Soit de la bommerie, soit on dit du prêt à la grosse. Alors le, donc quand on dit prêt à la grosse, en fait, on sous-entend prêt à la grosse aventure. And bottom loans, as well as prêt à la grosse aventure, meant someone lent to the insured an amount of money that was to be paid back with a huge interest, usually 25 or 33 percent, if the, if the ship came back with the merchandise or with the merchandise being sold, that is to say with the profit. But if the ship was lost or if the merchandise was lost, because in that time, you know, when the ship was stuck, was uh, caught in, in, a, in a storm, then you had to jettison the merchandise overboard so that the ship would not uh, sink, okay? So in order to save the ship sometime, you had to throw the merchandise. So either when the ship was lost or where the merchandise was lost, there was no need to pay back for the, for the loan. 
So in this respect, it was a kind of insurance contract. But it was as if the insurer first provided you with the payment, and then in the end you had to pay back the insurer plus the premium. But so, so the sequence of payment is different, but the idea is the same. Okay? So this, this did exist in Athens, um, well, you know, during the golden century of Athens in the, in the fifth century before Christ. But there are, there are also um, provisions for insurance in the Code of Hammurabi. So I don't know whether you're familiar with the Code of Hammurabi. You can find, find the code itself in, in the Louvre Museum, because we took it from Iraq um, at the beginning of the 20th century. I should say we, steal, we stole it from Iraq, of course. Um, and th this Code of Hammurabi is, in fact, a tall uh, stone of diorite which, which was made in the, you know, in, well, we say 1754 before Christ, but it, it took probably some time to engrave that stone because it's very hard, and it's engraved with thousands of cuneiformic characters, which, in fact, render the laws which were passed by Amurabi, that king, Babylonian king, okay? So almost, almost 40, 40 centuries ago. And, in fact, this is related to insurance, Insurance is only a small, small part of the code. But this was basically the not just the constitution of the state, but all the laws of the state were written on, the, on this stone. And among the, the, the laws that were written, one was related to uh, crop insurance in some, some way. And crop insurance is a kind of property casualty insurance, or professional insurance, if you want. But the idea is that... Um, in that time, as you probably know, the peasants were extremely poor and they did not own their, their land plots. So they rented the land from a landlord and they had to pay a rent for the renting the land. And so the Code of Murabi provided that in case of a flood or a drought, then the, the peasant was uh, free not to pay his rent. So that was a kind of, of you see, the, well, kind of insurance because you're supposed to, to pay to the landowner if you have enough uh, harvest, enough return to pay for the rent. But if not, there's no obligation for you to pay. Uh, well, who is the insurer in this case? Uh, nobody knows because there is no... Well, you can, you can think that, you know, the rent you paid last year was an insurance on the rent you're supposed to pay uh, the, the, year, the next year. But... Well, it's not a proper insurance because there is no premium pay. But we see that there is an element in insurance. And the interesting thing is that, you know, the state, um, as long as a king of the, you know, a king reigning 18th century before Christ could, could be thought or described as a state, but the state cared for insurance and for the welfare of the peasants. And there are other instances of insurance in the Code of Hammurabi, especially the provision of assistance. And what do we call assistance? Well, assistance is in fact a kind of insurance which is related not to paying cash, but to providing services. So when, when a risk, which is stated in the contract, uh, realizes, or is realized. So why not pay cash? Simply because, think of, you know, you break, you break a leg when you're climbing the Everest, you're not interested in getting cash. You're interested in being lifted to an hospital, of course, and, or, and, and to be brought back home. So in this case, you do not care for, for money. You, you do care for provision of service. Um, so you probably, all, all of you probably know this because when you engage on a, on a travel, uh, you're offered that kind of insurance, which people usually call travel insurance, but basically it's assistance or assistance. This is the provision of service in, in case something goes wrong with your trip. And uh, one, one kind of, of uh, assistance, assistance which is uh, quite um, uh, uh, widespread is, in fact, a road assistance, which may be part of, of car insurance contract. Okay, if you've got any, any problem with your car, well, if your car breaks down on the road, you just have to call a, an assistance number and then um, a towing truck will come and, and will tow your, your car to the next uh, 
to the next uh, car dealer or a uh, or place where you, you can get your car fixed. And the interesting thing here is not just that you don't pay for the, for the tow, tow truck. The point is simply that you have to call a phone number anytime, even in the night, and the, and the truck will come. So you're, you're paying not just for you know, being refunded, but also for provision of service that would not exist if it weren't provided by those guys. Uh, so what kind of assistance uh, was needed in the time of Hammurabi? That's an interesting question because people had no, no cars, well, I mean, I, 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 as much as I know, and they were not engaging into, into trips in the Everest range, or, but they were, in fact, engaging into risky trips, especially because merchants were also working for the king as spies. So it was quite usual that merchants were caught by enemy kings and taken as hostages. And so one, one of the provisions of the Amurabi law is that if a merchant is caught while he's away, well, we, we all know that this means spying for the king, then um, the, the temple will pay back for his ransom. What temple? We don't know, but basically, first the temple pays back. And if the temple has not enough money to pay back, then the king himself will pay back. The funny thing is that the temple goes in there. So you don't understand exactly what is the role of the temple is the Assyrian society 17th century back, well, 17th century before Christ. But you understand that temples played an important mercantile, that is economic and political role, which may still be the case today. But whatever, so you see that as far as 37 centuries, 38 centuries ago, both property casualty and assistance insurance existed. So uh, property and casualty insurance is something very antique. Now if we look at life insurance, it's no less antique because, well, you know there are two kinds of life insurance. We'll go into more detail when we look at the sector. There is life insurance in case of death, ce qu'on appelle nous de l'assurance d'essai, and there is life insurance in case of life. That is to say, the insurance against the risk of living too long. That sounds odd, but not entirely odd if you think about it, because when you're 80, 90, or 100 years old, it's not very convenient for you to work to earn your, your living. So you'd be better off if you can get some uh, income without working. That's the principle of insurance in case of life. So insurance in case of life existed at least since the Middle Ages. But we have found as well some Roman documents uh, which were measuring the value of life annuities. So we have some clues, only cl oh, I should say hints, okay, that there were life annuities uh, in, in the well, Middle Roman Empire. Albeit we don't know exactly the economic mechanism that was behind we have, we have some information because, in fact, there was a guy called Ulpian. In fact, the, the complete name of the guy is Neus Domitius Annius Ulpianus. Okay? And he lived from around 170 to around 223 or 28. Uh, he was born in, in Lebanon, uh, the, the country which is today Lebanon. And, and uh, in fact, where he wrote many legal texts, so he was a uh, jurisconsult. Uh, but one of his texts, which now is, well, from one of his texts, we extracted the Ulpian table, which is known no, only indirectly, which is to say we don't have the original text, but we have copies of the text or citation of the text, and especially of the table itself. So why was the table uh, inserted, in, in, inserted into a text? Because since the reign of Augustus, the first Roman empire, uh, emperor, there was a tax on inheritance. There was a 6% tax on inheritance. And the reason why life annuities should be valued was simply that in the beginning, people were giving life inheritance in order to turn around the inheritance tax. Because if you say, if you impose an inheritance tax, of course, then everything you have must be taxed. Okay? But in the beginning of the inheritance tax, for instance, um, Assume instead of having an income that could be taxed, you say, oh, I, my income is not a capital. It's only an income that has been given for life. So in this respect, 
as it does not live longer than me, I don't have to pay any inheritance on, on it, on this income. Well, at least my, my heirs won't have to pay a tax because when I, when I will die, the income will disappear. So this is the first reason why we don't have to pay uh, the tax on the, on, the, on the life annuities. But there is something more subtle. More subtle. Imagine that you're a wealthy man and you want to give all your wealth to someone once you're dead. But the problem is that you know they will pay a tax. What do you do? Um, but, well, you go to a banker and you ask for the banker to arrange a contract such that uh, the guy will be paid a yearly income or a monthly or a daily or whatever income until he's alive. And, and you pay for this. Well, you make a contract with a banker and, and that's it. When you die, the guy won't, won't pay the tax simply because there is no way to value the annuities contract. Well, there was no way until Ulpian proposed this table, which was supposed, in fact, to uh, assert the value of a life annuity. Okay. So the idea was, was in fact, to give a, a subject, well, an objective value to future annuities that have to be paid for, for instance, if the annuitant's age is between 0 and 19 years, then the European table said that the value of the annuity was 30 years multiplied by the value of the annuity, as if the annuity was supposed to be paid for 30 years. So there is no discount in this respect. There is no discount because the future annuities are not supposed to be discounted. Anyway, this table of Ulpian was considered by the early demographs as a mortality table or as a survival table. And it was used to compute life, life expectancy. And if you use that table to compute life expectancy, then you will compute a very high life expectancy for the Romans. While if you look at life expectancy in, in 17th or 18th century France, it's lower than 27 years old. So you would say, oh my god, life expectancy fell from the Roman Empire to, to 18th century France. But in fact, Ulpian is not at all con concerned with life expectancy. His only point is to make people pay for a tax, even when they try to turn around the tax by getting a uh, random contract which change the capital into an income which is not supposed to be valued. But now we would probably value very differently uh, a life annuity because we would use, on the one hand, you know, a discount rate, and on the other hand, uh, a life survival table, a life table using probabilities of surviving from one year to another. This is what we are going to do when we look with, into more detail with, uh, at the life insurance sector. But this was only to say that, in fact, insurance in case of life exists at least since the Middle Ages, because we have proofs that people were uh, buying uh, life annuities in the 13th century, for instance, and we have some, some hints that they existed since the Roman uh, Empire. Now, insurance in case of death, that is to say, you pay a premium, and in case you die, something will be paid to your uh, to the right owners, to the, to the, the, you know, when you pay a premium, you say, in case I die, please give the money to my widow, to my brother, to my wife, to whatever, okay? And um, the, the main aim of those Roman societies were to provide the death with a burial ceremony. Because in the ancient world, people thought that when you die, well, that's bad, of course, but it's, it's a bit better if you can get a nice burial ceremony because it will prepare you for the afterlife, you know? You have to, to prepare yourself for a long travel and you, you'll be buried with your, the most common tools you're living with, uh, some money to pay for the travel in the afterlife, etc. So uh, uh, we have to do things well so that you can live in the afterworld. This sounds maybe odd for you, but you know, in those times, and, and still today people, well, it seems that, you know, part of being a human being is taking care of the dead. Uh, we, we, we're not just animals. I mean, when we die, 
We don't like the idea of laying uh, bare on, on the ground, and well, it seems that taking care of the dead is uh, is a minimum. But it's it's re it was really a minimum because if you think about the widows, by that time the widows had no money when the when when the the bread earner, the pater familias, died. So insurance in case of death were very limited. And but during the Middle Ages, and especially the what we call the modern era, I mean since the the 17th century, widow's insurance developed. And widow's insurance are a mix between insurance in case of, of death and insurance in case of life. Because the idea is when the bread owner of a family dies, then a life annuity will be paid to the remaining parents so that she could take care of the kids and of herself also, but of the kids mainly. So this is what we call super annuity. Uh, for simply because in, in, in Latin, super vivere means uh, to outlive. Okay? So super annuity means annuities that are paid above, uh, implying above the head of the, of the one who died. Okay, so in fact, when, when we, we look at, at all those activities, uh, we can see that insurance is, is, is quite ancient because it dates back at least. 38th century, and, and the modern forms were invented between the Middle Ages and, and the early modern era. But one could say that, okay, cream is antique as well, so what's the point with insurance? Uh, people, ha people have been murdering one another since the, since the beginning of humanity, so there is, it doesn't mean that, that crime or murder is something interesting and amenable to economic analysis and, and loadable. But insurance is a bit different. Okay, it's, it's not only crime, it's, it's also the provision of, of services which are uh, part of, of welfare. It's not the opinion of, of every, uh, shall I say, civilization or culture or legal systems. Well, for instance, if you look at Islamic finance, I mean contemporary Islamic finance, because nobody has any idea of what, was, of what Islamic finance was like two centuries ago. But if we look, if we look at, at uh, Islamic finance as it exists, since the year 2000, uh, approximately, then insurance is forbidden, it's supposed to be haram, because it is related to gambling. And, and when you look at how an insurance contract is structured, in fact, it seems to be structured exactly in the same way as a lottery ticket. Because if, if you think of a lottery ticket, the, the idea is that you pay a small amount, and you have a very small probability to get a larger amount which is, of course, far below the mathematical expectation of, of uh, what you paid. Because, you know, the lottery house has to make money. And, of course, the money is made on your back. So, uh, so you pay far more than the mathematical expectation. And when you look at insurance, it appears to be the same, albeit not exactly on the same scale. Because the premium is a bit more expensive than a lottery ticket, and uh, the risk is a bit more is a bit higher than the the risk of winning with the lottery i mean with winning the, the largest prize with the lottery i mean there are far more car, car crashes than people uh, you know earning the jackpot at the lottery that that's why by the way the jackpot at the lottery is, is striking it's the reason is simply uh, you, uh, it, it's quite rare you know it makes you some someone peculiar uh, special but apparently, the contracts are structured in the same way. That is to say, you pay a small sum for a very small probability of earning a jackpot, which is both far higher than the amount you invested and has a very, 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 very low probability of, of occurring. But in fact, this comparison is, is wholly absurd for two very important reasons which should be understood in order to understand what insurance is. So the first reason why, why the, the comparison is absurd is in fact that you won't get richer with insurance. Because if you think of, of the lottery, of course the lottery, when you win, you win the, the prize on top of your current wealth. That is to say, you become richer. Okay. But now in case of insurance, you earn claims. Ah, vous avez, donc on vous paye une indemnité not on top of your wealth, but on top of your depleted wealth. And the point is that you're not supposed to get any richer. 
and that's not just a principle, it's the basis of insurance. When I say it's the basis of insurance, well, it was defined for the first time by the English Life Insurance Act in 1774, which stated that no insurance is to be made on the lives of persons having no interest. What does this mean? In fact, well, life insurance was completely forbidden in, in, on the continent. For a very, I mean, life insurance. Insurance in the case of death was forbidden on, on the continent during the modern era. In, in France, it was forbidden by the uh, Grande Ordonnance de Marine de Colbert, which was written in 1681, and which said that the life insurance, l'assurance sur la vie, est, est contre les bonnes mœurs. Simply because, how does life insur uh, insurance in the case of death work? You pay a premium, you state uh, a person who is called a head, and if the head deceased, then you get a payment. That seems to be uh, an, an incentive to killing the head you, you put a life insurance on. And for this reason, it was considered completely immoral on the continent. But, you know, in England, in a time where insurance was more or less a gamble, yeah, why, why not gamble on someone else's head? Well, why not? In 1774, there was this Life Insurance Act who said that you cannot sell a life insurance, well, you cannot buy a life insurance on the lives of persons having no interest, that is to say, you're not interested in those lives. Maybe, maybe the other way of describing what is a person you're in, you have interest in will be clearer. But basically, you, you're, on, you're authorized in buying a life insurance only for people you depend on or who are dependent on you. That is to say, you can buy life insurance only on your parents or your, your, your wife, I mean your partner, or your children's heads, but not on somebody else's heads. Why so? Because basically your parents, for some time you depend on them, because they are supposed to earn more than, more than you are, and once, the, once they do not earn, you're supposed to take care of them. So either you're interested because they, earn money, they can earn money for you, or because they cost you. So there's a reason then to, to have a life insurance on them, simply because, because they basically you have an interest, okay? But, so what, what life insurance claimed is that basically you can only take life insurance on the head of people, which would be a loss if you lose them, uh, not anybody else. Um, and, but insurance principle is also extended to things in general. You can only insure a property that you do own. For this reason, for instance, um, a credit default swap is not an insurance contract. You know what a credit default swap is? A credit default swap is a, a financial contract that will pay you something in case a debtor does not pay for his does not pay back for his credit. Okay. So this is different from credit insurance because if you buy a credit, well, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you take a loan from a bank, then the bank may ask you to, to get a loan insurance. And that will be insurance because you insure your loan. But you, if you do insure the fact that the Greek government won't pay back his debt, it's, it's no longer the insurance principle. Basically, you're doing a wager on whether the, the Greek government will pay back or not. While when you take a, a, a credit insur insurance for yourself, you won't gamble by saying, oh, I'm not paying so that I can get the payment. Because, because you wrote a contract where you committed yourself to paying for the credit. And of course, there will be a cost for you if you don't pay the credit. So basically, you have an interest in paying the credit. Because if you don't pay the credit, you will go to prison or you will be fine. Or you, there will be a penalty or whatever. So that's the reason why you, you can take credit insurance. So insurance principle is basically this, the, the idea that you cannot get rich through insurance because if insurance is to pay you something, it, it must be the compensation for something which is lost. Uh, in France, we don't have the insurance principle. We have what we call the principe indemnitaire. The funny thing is that there is no translation for principe indemnitaire and no translation for insurance principle, and they are not equivalent. 
But basically, it's the same, the same idea. That is to say, it's, the, it's a way of stating that you won't get richer with insurance. Hence, insurance is not a lottery. So the, the principe indemnitaire is described by, by a funny Roman phrase, which is in fact pointless, simply because you know, it's, it's Latin from, it's 18th century Latin, so it's, it's not classical Latin. So it's just as if I was lecturing in Latin, and well, it's the place, because as you know, it has been lecturing in Latin here until, well, until very recently, because there, there are still Latin classes, but I mean, even economics was taught in Latin uh, during the 19th century, okay? Because in the, well, until 1904, jusqu'en 1904, every professor with a Sorbonne had to defend uh, a thesis. Then, a in order to become a full professor, you had to defend a complementary thesis in Latin. Whatever was your specialty, even math. Okay. So, that's, that's, the, that's the complementary thesis. Assecuratus non querit lucrum. Bon, donc la, le, le, the insured does not look for, lucrum means uh, profit, said agit nein damnosit, but he acts in order not to, damn, uh, in damnosit, not to lose money, not to be in, in, into the damage. Okay? So basically, you, you, the principle indemnitaire means you cannot, you cannot make profit from insurance, all you can do is get your money back. So this is a, a very strong first reason why there is the, the parallel between, between gambling on the one hand and insurance on the other hand does not make sense. It, well, in fact, it made sense before the principe indemnitaire or before the insurance principle. That is to say, when you look at the early history of insurance in the Middle Ages or in the 17th century, basically, it's, these are insane wagers. Even in, in, in Britain, in the beginning of the 18th century, there was a so-called so insurance bubble where people were selling insurance contracts on, on almost everything. For instance, there was there were insurance on losing at the lottery, which, which makes, of course, no point. So, but, but this is to say that in that time, insurance was a wager. But once you get the insurance principle, it's no longer a wager because you, you cannot get rich. Of course, what you can do is try to, uh, you know, uh, to steal from the insurance company, okay, by uh, uh, filing fictitious claims and well. But this is this is not insurance. This is fraud, so it's something else. Uh, but there is a second reason why, why insurance is different from lottery, which is that basically both the provider of insurance, the insurer, and the buyer of insurance, the, the insured, they do have the same interest uh, up to a certain point. But their common interest is that uh, the risk doesn't materialize. Because when the risk comes in, of course the insured, he will lose something, but the insurer, he must pay. He must pay. So he's not interested in, in the realization of risk. Well, with a financial contract, what is lost by one, by one party is in fact earned by the other one. So in, an, in, in, a, in a purely financial contract or in a, in, yeah, in a purely financial contract or in a wager, uh, both, parts, both parties do not have the same interest. They have opposite interest. You can think that in the case of insurance, of course the insurer he has, in some respect, an interest which is opposed to the, to the insured, because every, every pound which will be paid, every money which will be paid to the, insurers, to the insured, is lost for, for, is lost for the insurer. But at least when we think of the risk, they do have a common interest in front of the risk. While in a financial contract, or in a lottery, or in a gamble, both parties do have an opposite interest in front of the risk. Because the, the triggering events, separates those who loses from those who gain. Now it's time. It's over. Now it's not over. But what, one very strong way to align the interests of the insurer and the insured is the deductible. Uh, deductible en français, c'est la franchise. In fact, the deductible is the sum which is not insured, first which will not paid back by the insurer. Uh, the deductible is, in fact, very old because, well, it, it comes from mar marine insurance and it was compulsory in marine insurance since at least the Consulat de, de Mar, which is a, a book which summarizes all the maritime law of the province of Valencia in southern uh, Catalonia. So the Consulat de Mar uh, has been published for the first time in 1494 
but it is thought that there were early uh, handwritten copies. So it's, it's quite uh, an old text. And the Consulate de Mar uh, fixed the deductible as 10% of the values insured. Why, why shall we say that it does align the interest of both the insured and the insurer? Simply because it guarantees the fact that the one who buys insurance, he will lose 10% of what he insured. Because if you pay, if the insurer pays for the whole value of the ship and the merchandise, then of course the insurer doesn't care anymore because he knows that whatever happens, he will get the money back. This is exactly what we call moral hazard. Okay. In, in maritime insurance, we don't call this moral hazard because moral hazard is a 19th century term. We call this baratrie de patron, but whatever. Um, the idea was, in order to align the interest of the insurer and the insured, the, it must be sure, we must be sure that the insured doesn't, doesn't get all of his money back. He loses something, as does the, the insured, so that we set up the deductible as absolutely compulsory. Do you have any idea of what was the punishment in case there was no deductible in the contract? Death. Okay, so... Um, just to say that this was serious matter. Of course, uh, in this respect, death, death was never applied as a penalty, but it simply meant that if you're caught, you better leave for good, because if you're caught a second time, then you'll be killed. Um, okay, uh, by the way, uh, the deductible, called in, in French franchise, was also made compulsory by Colbert's Ordonnance de Marine. That is to say, there is a strong uh, foundation to deductible in order to align the interest of both parties to the insurance contract. We'll see, when, when we look at uh, demand for insurance, we'll see how this works. Um, so, here we are. Insurance is ancient. Insurance is not a crime. <laughs> it is, it's not just a, gam a gamble. But now the, the next uh, point will be to show that insurance provides a real service and the, the provision of service is done via what we call mutuality. Where does mutuality come from? Well, it's a bit like diversification, but we'll start with an example. And by the way, in case you forgot, uh, I'm teaching statistics in, in third year, you will find with this example that it, it was designed for two reasons. First, it served to illustrate uh, portfolio diversification, okay? And on the other hand, it also served to illustrate uh, the mutuality principle in insurance. Okay, the idea goes, goes uh, so. Uh, you have two, two kind of financial assets with the same, well, the, the, the return on these financial assets is random, and all we know is that both financial assets do have the same expected return and same um, standard deviation of returns. Okay, so basically it's the same financial assets but there are two of them. That is to say, they can be correlated or not. And, well, you can see this set up with a portfolio selection approach by saying, okay, the first portfolio is that I buy, I buy 10 of the first asset. The second portfolio is I buy five of the first asset and five of the second asset. I'm not taking exactly this way because I'm thinking more of mutualization. So it's just another way of framing the same question. For instance, one way to look at mutualization is to ask, what shall we do in a couple? Shall we both work or sh shall only one of, of us work? For instance, in strategy, well, suppose we, we, we both in a couple have the same potential, the same human capital. Basically, we can earn the same income. Of course, the income is uncertain for, for many reasons, and whatever, in fact. But either one in the couple goes on the job market and works full time. He, he could earn 10, 10 times x. x is a random variable with the sa exactly the same properties, I mean, expectation and variance as y. He works alone, 10 units of time, he will get an income which is 10x. Or both of us go out and work for five units of time, but of course we cannot work any longer than one would alone because there are things to do in the household, taking care of the kids, uh, 
taking care of the trees or of the house or whatever, okay? But, so in the end, we spend the, the same time working. But in one case, there's only one of us working, in the other, uh, with risk pertaining to bargaining with, uh, with the customers, uh, with the, um, um, well, whatever. The idea is that per unit of time, there's a random variable which gives you a return, and if I work alone, then the income of the, of the household will be 10 times the random variable. If we work both uh, part-time, then the return of the household will be five times the first random and five times the second random variables. So what happens? It happens that, of course, the expected return will be the same, okay? Because the expected return for the first in the first case, will be 10x. Well, ex excuse me. Yeah. Will be the, 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 the expectation of 10x, that is 10 times the expectation of x. And of course, the expectation of x by the, by the exercise is mu. So it will be 10 mu. OK. In the second case, the expectation of 5x plus 5y is 5 times the expectation of x plus 5 times the expectation of y. That is to say, 5 times mu plus 5 times mu, that is 10 times mu. So the expectation is exactly the same. Now if we look at the variance, the variance of, in the first case, is the variance of 10 times x. So since the variance is not, of course, linear, it's a quadratic form. So the variance of 10x is 10 squared, so 100 times the variance of x. The variance of x being sigma squared. So the variance of 10x is 100 sigma squared. Fine. Now, if we look at the variance of the second strategy, I mean, each of us work part-time, then the variance of 5x plus 5y, for the same reason, in 25 is 25, I mean, 5 squared times the variance of x, plus 5 squared, 25, the variance of y, plus 5 by 5 by 2 covariance between x and y. So, this, since the variance of x is equal to the variance of y is equal to sigma squared, we have, in fact, 25 plus 25, 50 sigma squared, plus the covariance of x and y is, is the, again, sigma x times sigma y times the correlation coefficient between x and y. Let us call it rho x, y. And you multiply this by 25 by 2, that is 50 times. So in the end, the variance of the second uh, portfolio is 50 sigma squared plus 50 rho sigma squared. With rho being a correlation coefficient, rho is between minus 1 and, and 1. Rho is 1 if the, the per correlation between x and y is perfect, and rho is minus 1 if there's a perfect negative correlation. By the way, when there is a perfect negative correlation, the variable is no longer a random variable. The variable is, is, is always equal to the expectation. Okay? So, in fact, when there is a perfectly negative correlation between both variables, then the return will be, the, the variance will be zero, and the return of the, of the household will be the expected return. And then, when the, the, the coefficient correlation goes up, I mean, raises, the variance rises, but the maximum variance for the second strategy happens when the correlation coefficient is one, in which case the variance will be the same as the first strategy. So there is only one case when, the, when there is a perfect correlation between both x and y, where the variance of the second strategy is the same as the variance of the first strategy. But in any other cases, whatever the, var the value of rho, the variance of the second strategy is strictly less than the variance of the first strategy. So that's the, big, that's the benefit of mutualization. Basically, instead of having only one income, you have two incomes. What does this mean? It means that you pool your, your incomes together. So uh, how is this related to insurance? Of course, if you team together, if you pool your risks together, it means that the, the expense or the, the value of the, of the risk that will be realized will fall when you pull them, not the value, but the, the variance of the risk incurred will, will fall once you uh, multiply the number of risks that you pool. So that's, that's, in a nutshell, the principle of mutualization. But in order to get it maybe better, we should look at larger scale mutualization. In order to do so, 
um, let's make some, some assumptions. And in fact, I did not take the time to, uh, to do proper uh, slides. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, write them on the, to use the table to, to write them. That's it. So, so my, my idea here, here is to say that we have a city with 100,000 uh -huh. Do you think it works? This is the number of inhabitants, okay, 100,000. Then, then what? Then, we have a probability of fire which is 0.1%. So the probability is 0.1%. Then, the amount of, of damage which is caused by a fire, when the fire breaks in, it burns down the house, then the family has to be relocated, then the house has to be rebuilt, then the furniture has, has to be rebought, etc. So overall, the loss is said to be 200,000 euros. Oh my God, what is this? So the loss is supposed to be 200,000, okay? Now first, let's, let's look at um, what is the average damage that will be done every year. So the average damage, um, what is this? Let us call D the variable, which is the total damages, okay? The total loss. So the expected the expected D is in fact the number of house multiplied by the probability multiplied by the by the value of every house. By the way, what we see is that D, in fact, uh, D is, is is what is D? D is um, a Bernoulli variable multiplied by the, the value of a house, okay? So, um, we shall call N tilde, um, N tilde multiplied by L, N tilde being a Bernoulli or a binomial variable with 100,000 tries and the probability of 0.1%. Okay? So the expected damage is the number of houses, 100,000, multiplied by the probability, which is 0.1%, mult multiplied by the value of a house, Oh, I know this is what I'm writing is just awful. My handwriting is awful, but the, the, the only good point is that in the end I can save this and put this on the on the on the on the site on the website. So it's not absolutely necessary for you to uh, take this down and you know. Um, but so so what is my computation here? My computation is that basically I have a hundred thousand uh, divided by thousand. That is to say. Uh, here we have 100 multiplied by 200,000. So in the end, the average annual loss is 20 million. So what should be the premium if we design uh, an insurance scheme. The premium, in fact, could be computed in two ways. Okay? To compute the premium, let's, let's, let's think of the pure premium, which is the mathematical expectation, okay?
So there are two ways of thinking of the premium. The first way is to say, oh, we have a probability multiplied by a loss. The probability is 0.1%. The loss is 200,000. So 0.1% is 1 divided by 1,000. Hence, the premium should be 200 euros. Or you take the average overall loss, and we divide this by the population, which is 20 million divided by 100,000. And we got the same 200 euros. So the idea is that while well, you got one chance in, um, you got one, one in thousand chance to get your house burned down and to incur 200,000 euros of damage, um, you could get rid of this by paying a premium which is only 200 per, years, per year. The point then is not, not of course, about only about averages. Because if you think of average, um, you will wrongly think of, of insurance simply because you cannot, you know, if, if you stay on your own, you cannot do anything with this amount of money, 200 euros. You cannot store 200 euros until your house burns down. Because if the house burns down on the first year, you will be left with 200 euros and you have a burnt house which costs 200,000 and you cannot build it back. Or it, it cannot happen, you know, that every year one thousandth, you know, one tiny part of the house burns and the loss is thus a thousandth of the whole house. Now, it isn't the case. The point is that it's either all of or nothing. So reasoning in terms of average doesn't mean anything. So what shall we do? And how, sh how can we handle this in order to understand basically what mutuality does? So may maybe one way to think correctly about mutuality, I think, is to think in, shall I say, uh, statistical terms? Because suppose, for instance, that what we want is to be 99% sure. Ah, maybe that's not enough. Okay. So, we want to be 99.9% .9 sure to pay back the burnt house. How do we manage to do this? If you stay alone with your house, the only way to be 9.9% .9 sure is to have 200,000 euros in your pocket. Because either the house burns down and you have to have the money or it doesn't burn and, and, uh, and, and that's okay. But since there is 0.1%, you're not, well, maybe, maybe you will play on words and say, oh, there's only 0.1% that the house will burn. For me, it's a 99.9% .9 certainty. Okay, so let's take a 99.99% .99 certainty so that since there is a 0.1% probability that the house will burn, you cannot guarantee yourself that amount of safety by being alone with your house. But you can guarantee that amount of safety by teaming up together with other people in an insurance fund. For instance, think that we start, well, maybe we can think of the whole country the whole city, okay, and say there are 100,000 people in the city, see how can we be 99.9% .9 sure that we can pay back for all the houses that do burn down. One way to do this will be to set up a fund and each year we see how, how much it did cost and we pay back for the house that burned just by asking people to pay a tax that is equivalent to the amount of the house that burned down. You can do this. This is mutualization. This is not insurance, by the way. But the problem if we do this without thinking about it is that 
When we embark on this scheme, we have no idea of what it will cost. Oh yes, maybe we have some past statistics. But maybe also in the past statistic, what happens is that some house burnt were not reported simply because, simply because people do not file claims when they are not insured. So, so maybe we have no idea of what it will cost to do this. But moreover, it can happen that in the past, houses burned, but this was just an average value. And in the future, the some year, you know, the, the actual value of all the, the house burned down might be far higher than what happened in, in the 10 or 20 last years. Okay, so maybe we can do this by computing the, what shall I say, the confidence level, well, the, the, the premium that should be paid to guarantee with a confidence level of 99.9% .9 that we can pay for the claims of all the house burned down. So this is basically statistics, okay? Because what? Because we know that in in any in tilde, we said that this was um, uh, a binomial with a hundred thousand draws and a probability of zero point one percent. So what we know is that uh, this variable minus its expectation divided by the square root of its variance converge in probability to a normal, to a standard normal. So as it converges to a standard normal, let's call this Z. Okay? Because what we know is that the probability for Z to be below z, um, 0 0.9, well, 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 it doesn't work anymore. Yes, it does. So we can compute, we can find, you know, a value which we will call z, 0 0.99999, or the quantile, 0 0.9999, which is such that there is a probability, 99.99%, that the number of fires will be below that quantile. Okay, that's the basic of, um, of statistics. How much is this? How much is this Z, 0 0.99999? Well, guess what? We have to have a look at the tables, okay? So if I look at the tables, I guess I have some tables, guess where? In the directory for statistics. Yeah. Because if I look at my cahier TD, there should be some statistical tables in the end. Ah, that's, that's a nice memory. And what I'm looking for, of course, is the 99.99 .99 quantile. Guess what? Here it is, okay? And what, what is here, here is 3.62, simply. Because as you see, the next, the next value is 0 0.9998, where we look for this one. So 3.6, this column, the first column is zero, the next one is one, this one is two. So we get, we have this quantile, which is 3.62. So what? So that's fine. Because what we, what we see is that the probability of the, well, we say NA minus the expectation of NA divided by the square root of the variance of NA being below 3.62, This is the level of confidence we want. Fine. Um, but what, what can we do with this? Oh, you know what we can do with this. You know what we can do with this. Because what we have at this point is we have n tilde minus the expectation of n tilde 
divided by the square root of the variance of n tilde is below 3.62. So we can arrange this very simply to say that n tilde is less than its expectation plus 3.62 times the square root of its variance. What is the expectation? Remember, it's the probability multiplied by the number of houses. Probability is 0.1%. Number of houses is 100,000. So, uh, as much as I remember, this is 100. Um, what is the variance? Oh, you remember the variance of a, of a normal low, oh, no, of a, of a binomial variable. It's, it's in fact the probability multiplied by the number of case multiplied by 1 minus the probability. Okay, so we just computed the first one, which is 100. 100 multiplied by 0 0.99 is 99. Don't tell me this is difficult a variance to compute because, of course, the, the, the square root of 99, we don't know what is the square root of 99, but it will be enough to say that this is approximately the square root of 100, okay? Because the square root of 100 is 10, so it's among the simplest calculation we can do. And what we have here is 100 plus 36.2. So basically, if we want to be completely sure, we say that, because it doesn't make sense to have 0 0.2 fires. Okay. Oh my god, last year I had 0 0.2 fires in my home. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So to be sure that we get a majorant, we take 137. And we know that with a 99.9 .9 confidence level, which is quite high, believe me, with a 99.9 .9 confidence level, um, we will have less than 137 fires. So the, the premium which will be derived from this is in fact 1.37 times 200. Okay? So the premium which is the 99.9 .9 premium for 100,000 household is 1.37 times 200. So the fantastic thing is that by paying 37% by paying more than the expectation, we are 99.9% .9 sure than that we, we can pay back for all the houses that will be burnt. While if we pay only the mathematical expectation, what is the probability that we, that we can pay for all the burnt houses? Or what is the probability that a, a normal variable is above its expectation? You don't remember? You don't remember that a normal distribution is symmetrical around its mean, around its expectation. That is to say, the point with, with a normal variable is that you have 50% probability to be above the expectation, 50% to be below. That is to say, if you charge only the mathematical expectation, there is a 50% chance that you cannot pay for the, the damages incurred by your insurance. So that may be a problem. But now, if, as in the exercise, you have 100,000 insured with only a 37% premium on the mathematical expectation, then you can guarantee with a 99.9% .9, of confidence that you can pay back for all the losses. Uh, would it be any different if instead of 100,000 insured, we took, for instance, 1,000 insured. 
This is to illustrate how the neutralization principle works. So the question here, here is, is there any difference? with n equal to a thousand instead of a hundred thousand. Well, then if n is equal to a thousand, what we have is that the number of, well, we, we can write that exactly in the same way, okay, we have n tilde minus uh, the expectation divided by the square root of its variance is a normal 0, 1, etc. But now, let's look at what happens with n is equal to 1,000. What we have is that, in the same way, n a is below its expectation plus 3.62 multiplied by the square root of the variance. In fact, the formula doesn't change because the, the quantile is the same. We're still considering a random variable, which is normal. You remember that the central limit theorem works as long as there are more, more than 30, 30 n is about, about, above 30, okay? Once we have more than 30 households, it works. So how does it work there? What we have is that we have NA, Deal, which is below that time, the expectation is uh, n multiplied by p plus 362 n p 1 minus p. There, n multiplied by p is 1. Okay? Because it's 1,000 multiplied by 1 divided by 1,000. And there, what we have is the square root of 1 multiplied by 0, 0,99. Hence, now what we got is n is below approximately 4.62. So it's far less interesting. Because while the expectation is 1, the, the number of, of fires that has 99.9% not to be, um, not to happen, I mean, th th there is a probability 99.99% that the number of fire which will happen in a given year will be less than this. But now, the premium should be should be 4.62 multiplied by 200. This is not as good as it was. So what you see, well, it's still better than paying the full value of the house. Okay, but um, b because because basically this means around a thousand euros. Okay, while the value of the house is still two hundred thousand euros. It's far less attractive than it was because in the in the previous case we had to pay two hundred and seventy four euros. Now we have to pay almost one thousand euros. But one thousand euros in comparison with the house which is worth two hundred thousand. It's still good, because you, you'd, you'd be better off by paying 1,000 euro every year in order to get rid of the risk of losing your whole wealth, okay, than losing your whole wealth. Albeit it happens only one in, once in a millennium, because the point is that if it happens to you, it's not the same as the lottery. Once in a millennium is, is not a very low probability. It can happen, especially when you look at the probability that it happens in your, in your whole li life. We'll look at this in, in a moment. But here, as you see, and this was the, the, only, the only aim of this exercise 
was to illustrate the idea that, oh my God, how shall, how shall I save this? Um, good, this way, in fact. I'm just saving this. So it, it was only to illustrate the idea that mutualization, in fact, is such that, that it provides confidence into the possibility to pay back for the, for the consequences of a risk. And in fact, the larger the mutuality, I mean, the larger the number of persons, of people who are involved in insurance, the lowest the premium you have to pay above the premium, the confidence premium, shall I say. Because if you think of the pure premium as being the mathematical expectation, what is sure is that the pure premium only provides you with a 50% chance of paying for the, you know, for the losses incurred. You have to, to pay above the pure premium uh, a confidence premium. And that confidence premium is quickly decreasing with the size of the mutuality, I mean, with, with the size of the, the people who are paying for insurance. So this example is only intended to show you that having many people buying insurance is a very good way of, insu of uh, entering, with an E, entering uh, certainty, or almost certainty, near certainty. Uh, so maybe maybe we can maybe we want just to have a look at um, what is the probability so um, so I have a probability zero point one percent of a fire. What is the probability that I will not get a fire in in my whole life? If I live, for instance, a hundred years. Of course, this probability is 1 minus 0 0.1 percent power 100. Okay, so it's 99.9 .9 .9 power 100. How much is this? This looks better with an equal sign, you know. So it's 90%. Okay. So this, 90.5%. Conversely, the probability that I get at least one fire is one minus the probability we just computed. So it's 9.5%. So it's still worth asking whether it's not a good deal to pay only 270 euros per year to get rid of that risk, which is the risk of almost 10% in your whole life. Because if you think of it, if you save only 270 euros per year for 100 years, what you will get in the end, well, is nothing compared to the value of the house. Okay, because what you will get is 27,000 euros. Okay, it's almost 10% of the value of the house. But if the house burns down, you won't be able to, to buy a house. Especially if you're old, you won't be able to build it yourself. So overall, as you, can, as you can see, if the mutuality is large enough, so if there is enough people who buy for insurance, usually it's profitable to buy insurance. But now there is something that, <clears throat> in fact, you must know, which is that the, the smallest the thing you're insuring, the smallest you, the sums you're insuring, the more you pay for administrative fees. Okay, so, uh, but we'll talk about this later, maybe. So, but the idea here was to illustrate the fact that insurance is antique. Okay, but this, it does, this doesn't prove anything. Insurance is not a gamble. And the idea of insurance is simply to get certainty about being paid back. It's getting the certainty of not to lose your wealth. Of getting the certainty of not to lose what you have by this magic, which is simply the central limit theorem. Which is simply that when you use the central limit theorem, you show that the 
you know, the certainty premium is decreasing with the number of people who buy insurance. And that's it, it you know. For this reason, insurance look, looks very much like applied statistics and no more. Because once you get the central limit theorem and once you get the basic statistical exercise, which is computing the, you know, the certainty premium, you got the whole stuff. Maybe not entirely, because in fact, not all insurance contracts rely on the central limit theorem. But this is the main idea. Now, if you want to understand how the activity itself is carried on, uh, there are two more things to understand. The first one is about the inverted production cycle, which makes the insurance very spe special in all economic activities, in all economic sectors. And then the limits to insurability, as we defined it with the central limit theorem. So first, the inverted product production cycle. What do I mean by inverted production cycle? If you think of any economic activity, first you produce the goods, and then you sell them. Even if you think of a hairdresser, um, people pay you once they got their haircut. Okay, so even with the provision of services, you have to provide the good, the good or service first, and then you get the money. So the usual economic activity is, do, is that you, you must have some investment, some capital out before getting some, some income. With insurance, it's completely the contrary because first you get the premium, and then maybe sometime you will pay for the claims. That's the inverted production cycle. Okay, instead of doing the job and then getting the money, you first get the money and then some. No, no. Then you, you you do the job, but you're you're paid upfront. You're paid before you provide the service. Of course, you pay before the, you provide the service simply because if you if you try to do it the other way, nobody would pay. People would say, Ah, no, no, I didn't buy the insurance. Because, of course, as long as people do not have a, a, they do not experience the risk, they're not willing to pay. So for this reason, you have to, to make people pay up front. But since you make people pay up front, you get the cash first, and then sometime you must expand the money, sometime very late. Okay? Because if you think, for instance, you know, in, in France, there is what we call l'assurance décennale de construction. Every house builder is supposed to insure himself. He goes to an insurer and he pays for an insurance so that in case the house he built have a, an issue, the insurer will pay. Why, why is, the, is there a, a compulsory insurance? Simply because at some point in the law, when the law was enacted by, back in 74, I guess, the builder himself was li liable for, the, for the, the failures of the house. But of course, what, what the, bail, the, the builders did is that they, they go bankrupt every two years so that they don't have to, they, they were no longer liable for the liability. So the liability which was made compulsory by the law did not work. So the builders were required then to, to, to buy a house um, contract to ensure their liability as builders. So now, l'assurance décennale is supposed to work thanks to the provision of insurance services. And as this guarantee is lasting for 10 years, you know, the, the, the insurers may, they may make extremely late payments. Because if, you know, you build a house, somebody bu buys the house, you buy, you, you pay the premium for your uh, decennal construction insurance. Then it takes you two years to build a house. Then it takes you two years to sell the house. Then the guy experiences some failures after 10 years in the house. Then, of course, the builder will say, oh, no, it's not me. Or the guy, he, he was, you know, the way he used the house is not the right way. So you pay for an expert, then a lawyer, then there is a, a case in court. It takes another five years. And then in the end, after 20 years, you're supposed to pay something. So as you can see, the claims may be extremely delayed, okay? You, you prob probably also heard about those cases involving um, people who were born um, with a disability, and once they became an adult, they sued the, the physicians who, uh, you know, who made them uh, live. 
And, and so that is to say that the, 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 the suits, the, the legal proceedings were done 20 years or even later after the, the, the birth of those guys. And of course, the physicians, they were insured. But the, that is to say that the insurer had to pay claims decades after the, 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 the problem uh, uh, happened. So for this reason, well, of course, it's not the case when we are talking about health insurance. For instance, the health insurance you have uh, as students, when you go to the pharmacy, you, you pay the, you know, you, you expand the money and, and then the insurer pays back a week afterwards. So sometimes the inverted production cycle is a very short cycle, but sometimes the, the cycle can be very long. And whatever, every time the, the, the production cycle for insurance is the same, that is to say, the insurer first charges the service and then he pays sometime very late. And when I say very late, the, the problem is not that the, the insurer is not honest in paying late. The point is simply that it can take time for the risk to materialize. Yeah. If we see the, the, the service of the insurance, as yeah. the yeah. Yeah. You're right, and and this is the way. In fact, it is it is registered in the account of the insurance company. You you exactly make the point because at the moment where you sell the contract, you have to be able to say how much it will cost you in the future and to discount that value, because because. In order to compute the premium which is paid, you must have an idea of how much it will cost you, and a very precise idea. That's why, in fact, the balance sheet of an insurance company is very peculiar, as we will see. But basically, the idea is that, albeit you must know on time t0 how much you do charge, uh, you will pay probably later. While with, with uh, any other economic activities, the principle is that you, you give the good or you provide a service and then you're getting paid. But with insurance, you cannot do this way simply because people would not pay. That's it. So uh, I'm supposed to end the course 10 minutes before the time. Oh, no, well, we have some time still. And, and we can look at the balance sheet because, as you have said, um, even if the payments are made later, of course the insurer must have a very precise idea of how, in the end, he will have to expand to pay for, uh, for the contract. Okay? So for this reason, the balance sheet of an insurer is very different from the balance sheet of any economic activity. Because most of the liability side is made up of reserves or mathematical provisions, which are basically the expected value of future claims to be settled. Okay? C'est l'espérance mathématique des indemnités à payer. And when I say a large part of the, of the liability side, as you see, it's 85% of the liability side. Of, this is, in fact, the consolidated balance sheet of insurance institution of the Eurozone. So it's a quite large sample. Okay? This balance sheet is more than, than uh, 10, 10 billion euros, uh, 10,000 billion euros. Okay? So, and the rest, in fact, the rest of the liability side is almost nothing. So now, when when you look at the at the, the, the asset side, well, when you look at the asset side, what happens is that uh, what you have is that you have some cash because the insurer overall they they are used to pay on a quite rapid basis, especially you know those health insurers. Health insurers, in fact, they are providing. Uh, um, more or less uh, uh, cash service because basically they pay what you would pay but they provide you with a cash flow which is your, ca your cash flow of expense okay so for this reason they have to be liquid and for these reasons those companies they have maybe 50 percent of their well a large part of their balance sheet as cash okay but now if you look at, at life insurance companies for instance who you pay to life insurance company during all your working life, and then when you go on retirement, you start being paid a life annuity. Those companies, of course, they manage a huge amount of financial assets, which they store, expecting to pay you your pension years from now. There you have the two most different models of asset side for insurance companies. Those who are very liquid, 
because they provi provide liquidity service, such as health insurance company, enfin, ce qu'on appelle les mutuelles en français, d'accord hein? Pas la health insurance américaine, mais sur laquelle il y a aussi une dimension d'indemnisation et tout, donc ça peut être euh, moins liquide. But health insurance is basically liquid, hence much cash, and not much long-term assets, where life insurance is very illiquid, because you're, you're 25, you're paying to the life insurance company, and you're not supposed to get retired before 60, 65. So they store your assets during 40 years. So the, the assets, well, of course, the liability size of the balance sheet is what they owe to you, but the asset side is the assets where they invested your money. And this is basically very long-term assets. And the reason why they try to match, the, of course, the duration of the asset side with the duration of the liability side, if, if, that, if they don't do this, they will be exposed to a maturity mismatch risk. Okay, but so as you see, the inverted cycle makes the insurance activity very peculiar because it's a financial activity. But it's a financial activity where you have a uh, uh, liability side which is quite difficult to value and an asset side where you have specific risk and the largest risk with the asset side is the, is the matching of the liability duration. When you think of a bank, for instance, in the case of a bank, the liability side is well known because basically the, the liability side of a bank is deposits of the customers and then loans. And of course, a loan is such that you're supposed to pay back the amount that you borrowed, okay? While with insurance, the liability side, as you said, at the moment where you, you take the money from the customer, you're supposed to know how, what is the expectation, what you expect the, the contract to cost you. But in fact, very different things can happen. So this is, this is a mathematical equivalent of a very uncertain prospect. Well, on the other hand, when you look at the asset side of a bank balance sheet, this is very uncertain. But the insurers are looking for some certainty on the, on the asset side. Because you, ca you cannot have extreme randomness on both the asset and liability side. Because if you have no idea of your liability side and no idea of your asset side, then at some point there will be some problem. So the funny thing with insurers is that basically they're doing exa the exact opposite of what, what the bankers are doing. The bankers, they have a very, uh, very certain liability side, and they are playing with the asset side in order to, to get money. The insurers, they have a very uncertain liability side. Well, not entirely uncertain, because as we have seen, there are some regularities, and you can use some statistics. But, you know, there's nothing in, in, in the insurance contract, there's nothing like a loan contract. There is not written on the contract how many you will pay in the end. You have to pay. Many contracts do not even have limits. Okay? For instance, your uh, car insurance contract is probably unlimited. That is to say, you know, even if, if you have a car crash, if you're liable for a billion euros because uh, uh, you, you stick your, your car into a railway and then the TGV goes and it goes out of the rail and it goes into a bridge and the bridge collapses on a, on a, on a, on a motorway and all the, the cars are... Uh, crumbled, uh, collapsed by the, the bridge, etc., the insurer will pay. So at some point, there is extreme uncertainty. And, and so, so, for this reason, the activity is completely peculiar, and we'll see that um, the management of this balance sheet is a bit different from the, ma the management of a bank balance sheet. But before we go any further, we must analyze what is an insurable risk, because what we have the example we have taken so far is an example of mutualization, which was basically based on the central limit theorem. We will expand on this to think of risk insurability. That's all for today. Thank you for your attention and have a bright, nice week.